oh man, God is going to set somebody free today. God has an encouraging word for us. We are reading from the book of Zechariah. Okay. Zechariah is one of three minor prophets, they call them minor prophets, who are post-exile, um, and God decrees something through Zechariah. He gives them visions, about eight of them. Today we're going to look at one vision, profound vision, a profound message. Um, he decrees something very powerful. The people had been exiled. This is like 520 BC. They'd been exiled in Babylon. They're coming back and, and God has a word for them. And it's about rebuilding the temple. And it's about bringing the people back together. And what God says in this uh, is, I'm going to prosper you. He says it very loud and very clear through the prophet. He says, I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to bless you. And here's the verse 17, verse 1. Cry yet, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts. This is what I want you to say. My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. Some, everybody please just say prosperity with me. Prosperity. Yes! That's become a bad word because, oh, there's prosperity preachers who say, name it and claim it and blab it and glad, go grab it and you can just, you know, it's gotten all out of proportion. Let me tell you something. i am read my Bible and I'm sure you're reading your Bible and God wants his people to prosper. He says, be faithful in little and I'll give you more. And many people throughout the Bible have been prospered by God and have, have used their prosperity in many ways. And let me tell you, it's not just about money. You probably know that. That's just one little, little aspect of prosperity. Um, but anyway, thanks, buddy. I know. I start popping again. Popping. Um, I know. Sorry. Listen to this verse, all right? You're going to get some out of this. He says... You're going to be spread through prosperity, spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these that you're showing me? He says, oh, these are horns, horns which have scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. So here's Zechariah getting this picture of four horns. And the horns represent, in the Bible, the horns represent strength and authority. They represent empires and nations. Bless you. Um, there are certain cities and, and tribes and nations that have come against the God, God's people and it have caused them to scatter. Um, the horns... For centuries, you know, hunters would cut off the horns of their game and they would display them in the trophy room. It would be a trophy. They'd say, look what my power did, overcame the power of this beast, and they would display them. It means they won the battle, greater than their adversary. But listen to this. He showed them the, whole, the four horns. So you with me, Joe? you got the furrowed brow there. You're thinking about it. He's got the four horns. These are spirits and forces that have opposed God's people and called them, caused them to scatter. But then he says... Then the Lord showed me four carpenters. Man, I love this because my Jesus is a carpenter. Jesus, these represent the spirit of Jesus. He was a carpenter's son, a carpenter himself, grew up in a carpenter's shop, and knew how to use tools in order to construct and to build. So you got the four horns and a carpenter for each. You with me so far? Gets a word picture. Okay. And then Zechariah said, what are these coming to? What are they coming for? He said, well, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man lifts up his head. So, so the, the forces didn't just scatter God's people. He, he scattered them, spread them apart, divided them, and, and they can't even lift their head. They're in a place of, of weightiness and, and um, I would say, you ever, just, you ever just so beat up, you, just, you don't even want to look up, and you shuffle you shuffle the weights a lot. Sometimes we don't even know they're doing it. Someone says, boy, stand up straight. Oh, wow. What's wrong with me? So anyway, this is what's happened. They've, they've scattered him, so no man lifts his head up. But these craftsmen, a.k.a. carpenters, have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations that have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. Are you with me? It's a fight. It's a battle. It's a struggle. These horns represent spirits of opposition because we know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. That is our fight. How many know there's a devil on the loose? 
He's real. He's real. He hates you. He wants to kill. He wants to steal. He wants to destroy. And he has strategies and deceptions and evil rulers and authorities and powers. And today, clearly today, there are still evil spirits working to scatter God's people and bring division. And, and they want to tear down what God wants to build up. And they want to thwart the plan of God at every turn. Okay? The first point for your notes, the first fill in, it doesn't have a number, it's just over all the other points, is no evil spirit can stand against the carpenter. That's such a good, it's true, it's such a great truth. No evil spirit can stand against the spirit of the carpenter. Joshua 1, 5 God tells him, nobody's going to be able to stand against you as long as you live. That's pretty cool, right? Joshua, nobody is going to be able to stand against you as long as you live. I'm going to be with you like I was your... Moses. He says, I'm going to be there, so be strong. I won't fail you. I won't abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. I want you to prosper, he says. I want them to prosper. But be strong and be courageous and be careful to obey my instructions that, God, that Moses gave you. Remember, Moses gave the instruction. God is reinforcing them now to Joshua. He's like, Joshua, be careful. Obey what I said. Don't deviate from them. Don't turn to the right or the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Thank you, my brother. Woo! Because if I'm sweating, they're going to start sweating. So um, thank you. I don't mind sweating a little for Jesus, but um, he sweated blood for me. Anyway, he says you're going to be successful in everything you do. Study the book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, someone say only then. Please get this. I want you to prosper. I will help you prosper. I'll be with you. But here's your job. Study it. Meditate on it day and day. And then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Don't be discouraged. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Listen to me. In every covenant relationship which God entered into, he multiplied, you guys. He increased. He built up. He advanced. He advanced. He says, build my kingdom. I will build my church. He uses words of construction. In every covenant relationship where God is in covenant with one of his people, that's what God does. He multiplies and he builds. And I want to, uh, the message of, of, well, the title of the message today, you can read it. It's called the horns and the hammer. The horns we already said represent evil spirits. The hammer to me represents the carpenter. The carpenter knows how to build and the chief tool in his arsenal is the hammer. Not that he's going to beat us with the hammer, but I wouldn't want to be the horn. Amen? Again, horns represent evil thoughts and oppressive spirits that influence God's people negatively and hold us back. The spirit of the carpenter is represented appropriately, I believe, by the hammer. And there's four evil spirits that I want to identify to you. You can call them mindsets. You can call them forces. You can call them spirits. I'm calling them spirits because that's what I believe the Bible teaches us that we have to guard against. That is our fight. And we've got to uh, fight them and guard against them if we're going to be successful in life. So the first spirit is the spirit of lack. Lack. Psalm 34, 9 says, Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. It means, you know, the spirit of lack tells you you don't have enough. It's not enough. You're not enough. Your spouse isn't enough. Your parents weren't enough. You don't have enough. You'll never be enough. But this word says that young lions will suffer want. Strong animals will want. They'll be hungry. But those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. The spirit of lack says loud and clear in your head, you don't have enough. There's just not enough to go around. And it could be a lack of confidence that you suffer from. It could be a lack of clarity. It could be a lack of education, I don't have all the pedigrees, not enough money, not enough connections, not enough opportunity, not enough love, there's just not enough joy, I didn't have a father like that so I don't have enough and I'll never be enough because I didn't have a mother in that way, I don't have enough self-esteem. That spirit needs to go. 
And God's people have been fighting this spirit for a long time. And remember, when we talk about these people in the Bible, I got some examples for you. The, the Bible says they were just like us. They were just like us. Even the prophets like Elijah and Moses, just like us. And Moses, he was plagued by this spirit at one point in his life. God came to him miraculously. Burning bush told him what he wanted him to do. And he goes, God, I don't have enough of, 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 of skill, skill, skill. I still, still, I'm not good at talking, God. I'm not, I'm not a good orator. I don't have enough. And at one point it says God's anger burned against him. He was so mad at this attitude. God wanted him to change the world. He was focused on not having enough. Gideon, he, the angel of God, the angel of God, pre-incarnate of Christ, came to him hiding. He's hiding in the wheat, you know, th cellar, basically, and calls him mighty man of God. Hey, warrior. And he's like, you want me, you, you want me to do what? I, my clan, he tells the angel, my clan is the least in the whole land. My clan of Manasseh, they're the least of, of all of them. And and the least... In my whole family, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the least. I don't have enough, God. But God wanted him to defeat a huge army. And Gideon doubted God over and over, tested God over and over, had to make sure. Elijah asked the widow, what do you have in the house? She goes, practically nothing. Like one little jar of oil. We're going to die here in a minute. And God wanted to do a miracle that showed that when it looks like all hope is lost and there's nothing in the cupboard, that he can pour out more than anyone can contain. And as many vessels as the boy could run around the neighborhood and collect, that's how much God wanted to pour out. And God probably would have poured out still today if they would have keep on bringing in more vessels. But you know who did not have a spirit of lack? Another widow in the Bible. The lady with the two mites, where people are coming up and making a show, dropping money into these trumps, I think they call them, spittoon-like things, where they would throw money and it would <laughs> clatter, and the more coins, the more loud it was. And here comes a little lady, and no one heard anything. It was just two little mites, and people are <laughs> snickering and whispering, and Jesus goes, that lady... Say what you want. She has more faith than all of you. No spirit of lack whatsoever. Nobody ran and got the mites. At least I didn't read that story where they took them back out and ran after and go, ma'am, ma'am, here, you, 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 you got to take, you're too poor and you're too pitiful. And you don't get to participate in the things of God. No, she gave and Jesus marveled and he said, she gave more than all of you. You just think she has a lack. Isn't that good? You guys with me? It is so important for you and I to realize that God's dream for us is much bigger than our dreams for ourselves. It's so much bigger, you guys. God says, I have a purpose for you and I have a promise for you and you will succeed. And if you believe me, there's nothing that man can do to stop you. And if your enemies come to oppose you, I will oppose them. That's the God we serve. We have days and we have experiences and seasons of this life that are so hard. Can we, I mean, really, uh, all of us, we, they're punishing and so heavy. That after a while, we came and lift up our head, you know, and we're just walking around. We're not even, we're not looking at God's vision. We're not looking at the horizon. We just, I got to get one more step in front of me. We get, we even become bent over and shuffling and not having a, peer, a, a clear vision because of pain and trauma, and we get disoriented. But here comes the spirit of the carpenter. And he builds us up. And he looks out. And we can look up. We can look past our wounds and capture the vision that God has for us and have the strength to pursue it. And I know, I know, guys, that I'm here this morning to make a, pro, a proclamation over your life that the spirit of the carpenter will come upon us here right now under this tent, under this teaching from God, and... Things will change. Because when the spirit of the carpenter is upon us, nobody, nobody can stop you. Not a voice from your past. Not a voice in your head of your own making. Not a voice in your future. No voice of opposition can strike you down. It can't take you off track from the work that God has for you. <sighs> God is trying to get us to let it go. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. The, the Lord is my shepherd, shepherd, I have more than enough. That's the first spirit we need to get rid of. You with me so far? Lord, rebuke that spirit of lack in this place because your word says that you can do all and more, exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or even think, God. You are our shepherd, we shall not want. Next spirit, spirit of limitation. It's kind of similar. The spirit of, of lack says you don't have enough, you'll never be enough, there's not enough. And the spirit of limitation is different, I think. It's, it's intimidating. It kind of makes us cower a little bit. Okay, I know God, and I know he's, he's got powerful, you know, he can do what he wants, but he's not going to do it for me because, you know, it just is what it is. I mean, we have to define reality, and it is what it is. And, and when a person can acknowledge the power of God and the promises of God, but they don't believe that those power, that power and those promises can never be for them. It's just out there somewhere. So they walk in this weird kind of mediocrity. And they don't see possibilities. They just see limitations. My Bible nowhere says call what it is what it is. He says call things that be not as though it what? As though it were. He says faith is the substance of things what? Somebody. Hope for the evidence of things I can't see. If I'm hoping for it, it's obviously not here because if it's here, I'm already celebrating. But if I'm hoping for it, then it's on the way. But I'm supposed to believe for what I hope for even though I don't see it because it's substance and it's evidence that God is who he says he is. And um, man, once when I was little, I got in trouble for something. And my dad was really mad, and it, it struck me because I didn't remember this lesson, but he got mad. He, I said, what? I said, I can't. And he said, we don't say can't in this family. I, I, I said, we don't? <laughs> I didn't ever heard. He said, we don't say, and he was mad. You don't say, we don't say can't in this family. And I'm so thankful for that. Dad, if you're watching this, I love you. And I am so grateful for that word because as a believer, I have adopted that I, I don't say can't about anything. And it's not that, okay, two, two ways to look at it. People think, well, Christianity is so, ex you know, oh, you, Pastor Jeremy, you can't, you can't do this. You can't do that. You said you're a believer. You can't do this. You can't do that. God said, no, you can do whatever you want. He says, I'm going to put choices before you, and there's going to be life over here and death over here, and there's going to be blessing over here and, and curses over here, and you can do whatever you want. The choice is yours. And, and it's written in there that, uh, you know, all things are okay for me. I mean, I can do whatever I want, but not all things are good for me. And that's why God gives me instruction. So I don't have that can't in my life. Everything is a choice. And then the other thing is, well, you know, you're, you think you're all, you know, you can just do. I don't think I can do everything. I don't really think I can do anything, but I can do anything God wants me to do. And you can do anything and everything God wants me to do because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and strengthens you. So I'm not saying can't anymore. I can't say that. I mean, I won't say that. You guys with me? Thanks, Dad. It's a glass ceiling, a spirit of limitation. It says you're never going to get up. You're never going to go higher. You're never going to get healed of cancer. You're never going to be able to walk. You're never going to be able to do this. Uh, and, and many people don't even consider it. It's not even an option. But I hear God saying, well, you know what? If that's... um." That's all you're going to believe me for. Well, as a man thinking, thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I know what you believe because out of the heart the mouth speaks. And when you speak, there's power of life and death. So much so that the Bible says I'll eat the fruit of what I say. That I'll, I'll, I'll love it or I'll hate it. But whatever it is, it's coming from a heart that either believes or doesn't believe. And we put so many limits on ourselves. And when you put limits on yourself, you're putting a limit on God. I use this in the first service. Maybe you've heard this. Um, it's true. It's about elephants and how they train them in the circus and in performances and stuff like that. And, and basically, it's through fear and intimidation of trauma in their past. And the way they cause trauma is they take a little baby elephant and they put the little stake in the ground. And they put the stake connected to a chain. And the chain connects to a shackle. And the shackle's tight. And it's on one of his four legs. And so when he's little, they don't have to beat him or starve him or any of that, though they do that too sometimes. They, the elephant would try to get away and that would pull on him and it would hurt. And they would leave that shackle on there for quite a bit of time and the elephant grows, but the shackle doesn't grow. So it gets tighter and tighter and it's very painful. And if you pull on that little stake, 
it hurts. And the elephant learns this. But the elephant grows big and powerful. Could smash this tent and walk around on people's cars. Elephants are extremely uh, powerful beasts, but they've learned at a young age, and they can pull, a circus can pull into town with a big elephant. Oh, put a new shackle on, run that chain over here, put it in the ground, and this little stake a couple feet long in the ground, the elephant's like, I ain't going nowhere. I won't even try because of, of a painful past experience that robs them of their strength and of their majesty and of the power that they could have so easily. I think that's a good example because in the same way, our fear is often a negative response to what Satan and the world has already done to us in our lives. But faith is a positive response to what Jesus Christ has already done 2,000 years ago on the cross. Does that make sense? Talking about a spirit of limitation. We can't tolerate that, you guys. I love the story of David and Goliath. I'm sure everybody does in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm condensed it a little bit, but he did not have that spirit of limitation. He came in. What's going on? God, what is going on? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is cussing about God? He's saying bad things about God and God's people. Why is nobody doing anything? And, you know, they brushed him off. Little guy, give me the cheese. Get out of here. What do you know? You're just a little guy. And the word says for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. And David asked the question again, who is this? Un and the uncircumcised part here, that just means who is this? Who is this who is not in covenant with God? Who is this who is completely out of alignment, actually opposing our God? And, and they brush him off and he says, David's like, now what have I done? What, I can't even talk? It says, can I even speak? And then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. But Saul heard what David was saying and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go fight him. I'll go fight him. This little shepherd boy, Saul said, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. Limitation. He said, you're only a young man and he has been a warrior from his youth. Not to mention you're little. He's very big. But David said to Saul, your servant, me, has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came, I didn't have a, uh, and, and it wanted to carry off a sheep from the flock. I didn't have a spirit of limitation. I went after it. I struck it down. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I didn't have a spirit of limitation. I grabbed it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant that you're talking to right now has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this baby giant. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and he saw what, that he was little more than a boy glowing with health and handsome and he despised him and he said to David am I a dog that you come at me with sticks and the Philistine cursed David by his gods little little g gods come here he said and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals David said to the Philistine you come against me with sword and spear and javelin I can almost hear him ha but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down, I'll cut off your head, and I'll feed it to the wild animals. And the whole world will know, not that there's a little shepherd boy in Israel, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword, it is not by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you, not just you, big boy, but all of you, he's going to give you into our hands. This day you will fall. And the Philistine, and this is great, you guys got to get this, the Philistine moved closer to attack him, and David ran, read the rest, he ran quickly forward to the battle line to meet that giant. Man, there is no spirit of limitation or lack on that kid. And so he triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Glory to God. Glory to God. Can we take a praise break for a minute? This is a real story. 
Wow. And then Ezra, he was going to, he wrote about uh, King Cyrus of Persia. This is very short. He said, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth because he's unlimited. We're talking about being unlimited. God being unlimited. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. He's a builder. It's the spirit of the carpenter. I got a question for you. What is God trying to build through you? Through you. Anybody got something down in here that just, you know God's got something that's been wanting to get out. Sometimes you forget about it because it's down in, in the basement. But God wants to build something through you. Is it a, is it a nation that believes? Is it a family that prevails? Is it a legacy that points to the throne of God and outlives you and outlives your spouse? What is holding you back? The spirit of the carpenter is trying to break through your limitations and build something. God is trying to deliver somebody here today. And it's the spirit of the carpenter. He wants to build. And you know what? In this place, I'm going to take a little aside. We're building a temple. How many know we're building a temple right here? Right here in this place. Right here in Winchester, Menifee, Riverside County, California, United States of America. We love our tent, okay? We don't despise small beginnings. We love our tent. We celebrate the fact that the church is not, the, uh, not a building. That the church is the people, Right? Okay, we, let's be clear on that. But somewhere along the way, I just got to talk to you for a minute. Somewhere along the way, I would like you to be able to hear the word of God over the swamp coolers in the back. I'm grateful for the evaporative coolers and people donated those and, or somebody and we, we paid. So anyway, I want you to be able to hear the word of God and not have to put all these special precautions in to yeah, I'll spare you what we have to do every week for this message to be heard. I would like for there not to be puddles in the sanctuary when it rains. I never forget last time it rained real hard I jumped off the stage I was trying to make a point and water went and splashed all over the couple people the first time here. Not here today. <laughs> And I would like for the cables and the sensitive electronics to work like they should work because no moisture got on them and no dust got on them when it's time for us to worship. And it's a great, funny story. Ha, 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 Pastor Brett, that the squirrels ate the communion elements and we laugh about it. And we remember the day we had 230 little, little, little wine cups with a little wafer on top and all of them had little fang marks and they were all empty. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what was that? Yes, holy squirrels. But that was meant, that body and blood was meant for, that's a body and blood of Christ. It was meant for his people. And I love how resourceful our deacons and ushers and our volunteer team are, man. We can fix anything with duct tape and zip ties. They're everywhere. Look, you can't count how many duct tape and zip ties places there are. But at some point, you guys, we are called to build God's house. At some point. And that's all of us. And I, for one, hear God saying, look, if this is all you ever want, that's probably all you're going to see. But if you'll believe me, rise up. If you'll believe me and rise up, because I, I can do everything exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or even think. So... I mean, thank you for the duct tape and the zip ties, and thank you for ministering the body and blood to the squirrels of Menifee, but I am the carpenter, and I'm bringing my hammer down on the spirit of limitation. It is time to rise up and build, you guys, and I've been trying to think of how to introduce this to you, talk to you about it. We've already ordered a steel building. I want to show you some pictures. It's due here pretty soon. That's just a rendering, and these are all renderings, and they aren't the complete picture, but this is part of it. Um, Show a couple more. We're going to do, uh, it's probably going to be, well, no, probably. It's already been ordered. It's white with black trim and a green roof. It's going to be much prettier than this. Show some other pictures. We thought about, okay, windows, all right. Um, this tent, just so you know, is 40 by 60. That uh, structure is about 10 feet actually nine feet wider on each side, and it's about five feet taller, and we got windows, and when it's in, um, we're going to, it's going to be right over, right over there, just right down the steps, and just right over there by the baptistry, and, and when it's in, um, we're going to put lots of awnings, and beautiful walkways, and, and coverings, and um, it won't be this sweaty, um, but it, here's the thing, it's going to cost like 250,000 bucks or something, Probably, because I always, at first it was like 87000 for the metal kit, and then it was uh, 20000 for seats and 20000 for air conditioning. Let's just call it a quarter mil just to get it situated. Um, 
oh no, how are we going to get, I don't know. I don't really, I don't, I mean, the vision's got to be bigger than this. And you guys know, our first and foremost, what I want is for us to have a healthy church. Size of, of everything is, is for sure down the list. I pray to God. When I see you guys, especially after church, it's long been my favorite time of, of this experience, is I see the people talking and laughing and sometimes crying and praying and ministering and breaking bread, and whatever happens, it's the most beautiful thing to see the people of God and the Spirit of God amongst the people without a bunch of strife and a bunch of division and a bunch of garbage. I see people every single day running stuff to the hospital and running to people's houses and cooking and, and taking care and bearing one another's burdens just like the book of Acts. I'm seeing it. I've heard about it for years, and I've seen it in glimpses, but I've never seen it like I've been seeing it since, since Rise Up Rose Up. And I just, I pray to God, God, whatever happens as we grow and we follow your leading, whatever happens, please let us keep this culture. Let us keep this culture. I don't want to just say we love each other, God. We want to love. And so that's our prayer. That being said, there's still a vision. We're talking with some people now about a Bible enrichment program for little kids who can't get the Bible at the schools that they go to. So we're working on that. I've talked to many of you about, um, some of you have, have a wonderful gift of painting or photography or writing or um, songwriting, music, different things. And I can't wait to have uh, a gallery and a studio. It's a form of evangelism where we can distribute that stuff and also where we can help ministries and businesses that are faith-based have an incubation period where a center where we can teach them about faith and how to do it according to God's will. I just, there's so many things I don't get to talk to you about um, that much. I'd like to have a wellness center and classrooms and Bible training and out there, some of you don't know this, but probably no one does. You see all the bulldozers and rocks and well, some of those bulldozers, if we go to rent them, they're like $5,000 a day and we're not doing that. But God has blessed us with people who want to bless us. So uh, we let them put dirt here or rocks here. They do some landscaping for us. They leave the equipment. We got a guy who knows how to use it. Right now, we're making a replica of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea where Jesus was buried and rose again in big boulders. It's actually bigger than the original, but we're trying to keep it authentic. And just so happens that Salvador, who is building it, has been over there about nine times. He says, no, pastor, you got to put the door right here. And we only room for like six people in the real one. We're going to make room for 10 so field trips can come and people can send the kids and they can see the tumba, the tumba de Jose de Armitea. And we're going to put it over here. And but Gogota means skull and there's going to be a mountain with crosses on it like we used to have, only bigger and better positioned off to the right. I mean, we're working on this stuff. And I think it's going to be a great place to have a platform and maybe an outdoor amphitheater that's bigger than the little one that we have so that we can accommodate celebrations and worship for God. This is just some of the... Oh, yeah, show some more pictures. Is that the last one? So I think it's kind of cool, don't you? Um, that's inside. We're going to have to pretty it up and add wood and insulation and different things like that. Show some more. Red was, was one of the ones we were thinking about, but we ended up with white. Um, but... Uh, I hope you'll be part of it. It's going to be out there. We'll probably keep the tent because that's not going to be enough either. So we'll probably use this for the youth and some other things. Keep on going through them. I don't know how many there are. But um, anyway, again, it's going to be much prettier than that when we're done. But that's just basic renderings. And I know some of you, $250,000. We're just a little church. Where is it going to come from? For some people, that's like, oh, I don't know. That's the lid. Where's that going to come from? I don't know. There's more than 250 people that call this church their home, believe it or not, on our email list and stuff like that. That's only like an extra $1,000 over six months or whatever, or a year for people that, I mean, I don't know. Some people go, that's it? That's it? It's only the beginning. It's, it's your mentality. And... Um, God, I, I hear God going, look, every one of your houses who have a house, it, yours are worth two or three times that much. And then it's going to cost for a little sanctuary. You think I can't afford as much as you? So God, we're not limiting you. <laughs> we're not limiting God. Oh man, just you guys, I just want to, I hope you'll be part of it and be faithful to your giving. And, and uh, listen, God never guilts us into paying for, for something. That's not how it works. He doesn't 
um, coerce us into giving. He doesn't want us to be manipulated. But he did say, give. He did say, give. And he said, give, and it shall be given unto you. He said, give and do it with a, a, not just a smile on your face, a real, uh, he's like, he said, give joyfully, like to literally give. He said, I want you to be generous on every occasion and I'll supply your every need. And, and not, we're not supposed to get, oh, oh, here, he said, talking about money, you get cirrhosis of the giver and the arm shrinks up all of a sudden. You can't, you can't reach your wallet. It's like, I don't know. We're not supposed to be like that. God says, I'm the carpenter and I'm going to bring the hammer down on every spirit of limitation in your life. Take him at his word. Job 11, 7 says, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? Answer is no, by the way. Um, they're as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than Shoal. It means you can go as higher than you can imagine and lower than you can imagine. What can you know? Its measurement of God is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes by or apprehends people or calls an assembly, who can restrain him? The answer is nobody. And we need to get free from limitation. Those that keep our heads down because that does not reflect the God we worship. Somebody say amen for me. Okay. Um, Okay, so lack pulls us down. You don't have enough. Uh, limitation keeps you from going up. Glass ceiling. Bounce, bounce, bounce. They used to... Uh, nah, I'll spare you the analogy. You know what I'm talking about. Glass ceiling. It's, the third one is a hindering spirit. And sometimes if the enemy can't get us with lack or limitation because you're just too darn faithful, a lot of times he'll put obstacles in your path. How many have ever felt like, no matter which way I go, like every, I'm doing everything right, Lord, I'm believing you and I'm trusting you, but it seems like every time I turn around, I, I bump into some kind of roadblock. And Paul had the same problem. He says to the Thessalonians, he goes, since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, we were ripped apart in person, not, not in heart. He's like, not, not really, but like physically, we weren't able to be with you. We wanted to be with you. It was a great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. He said, I, Paul, again and again, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to. He said, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered the great apostle Paul. And in Daniel, man, this is a, another famous hindrance, an angel a magnificent angel visits Daniel and he says, don't be afraid. I want you to know something. Since the first day that you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, since the first day, God heard you. He, re he heard you in heaven. Your request has been heard. But for 21, oh, and he says, and I've come, I've been dispatched. I've come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the king of Persia, or the kingdom of Persia, blocked my way. An angel, a mighty warrior, angel of God, said, the minute you prayed and humbled yourself, God sent me, and I've been on my way. But a, 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 a spirit got in my way and hindered me. And um, hindering spirits create obstacles. I'm, I did this first service. I think I'll do some again. Come on up here, um, Reddick, please. I won't embarrass you. He's like too late. Um, so, so um, come over here for me, right over here, if you would. So hindering spirits, what they do is they make it difficult. You're trying to go one way. I'm trying to go toward the cross. Give me some opposition. Don't hit me or anything. But this is a hindering spirit. I'm trying to go toward the cross. Push back. Push back. A hindering spirit. Well, I'll go this way. Block me. Block me. I'll go this way. Block me. Block me. That's what a hindering spirit does. Um, I need another one. Someone up. Come on up, Fino. Come on. Daniel, come on up. Come on up. We'll make this fast. It's just for the sake of illustration. So stay right there. You, you join him as a hindering spirit, if you would, Fino. And um, they're stumbling blocks. They, they, they come on over here. They can block us. And you know, it can sometimes be people close to you. So I'm going to go this way, but I can't get past him. So I'll go by the man in the tie. He looks nice, but he's not. And I can't get through him. And, and so it's sometimes people you know, the closest people to you. There's a famous uh, scene in Matthew where... Peter is actually trying to encourage Jesus. That's not going to happen. That ain't going to happen on my watch. And Jesus goes, get behind me, Satan, because you're in front of me and you are keeping me from the cross. Even his closest homie. And so there are hindering spirits. It's in the Bible. And you know what? There are also, if God can't get us that way, or if the Satan, sorry, slow down, Pastor Brett. <sighs> Take it easy. If Satan can't block our way, come closer. There's something called a devouring spirit. Now, 
hindering spirits are in front of me. They're trying to block me from where God wants to go. Devouring spirits come at me from behind. Stop me. Try to stop me. Try to stop me. Try to stop me. You can't stop me. He's trying to stop what's already behind me. He's trying to stop what's already behind me and ruin that. Does that make sense? And these are all identifiable. Thank you. High five. High five. High five. Sorry. I got there. Okay. So um, give them a hand because I want to explain this a little bit. So when I talk about the devouring spirit, the, the first verse that I think about is when God's talking about tithes. In Malachi, he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. He's talking about crops. You would bring, a tithe oftentimes would be livestock or it would be, vege- you know, crops. And he says, now, do that so that there's food for people in my house. And then try me, test me in this. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out such a blessing that there will not be enough room for you to receive it. And listen to this. This he says, then I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. What does that mean? Well, he won't destroy the fruit of your ground. That's behind me. I've already planted that. I've already planted. I've, I've uh, nurtured the soil and watered. This is behind me. And so I've got a hindering spirit in front of me trying to stop me from where I'm going. I've got a devouring spirit that threatened to come behind me and ruin what I've already done. God, I worked so hard for that. I worked so hard for that promotion. I worked so hard for this marriage. I worked so hard for these crops. You gave me seed and I sowed it. And God says... I'll destroy, I'll rebuke the devourer, and the vine will not fail to bear fruit for you in the field. So, coming to a close here, but the word says that we're supposed to be careful of these things and be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Why is he roaring? Anybody? Anybody? Fear. Thank you, Pastor Dave. To cause fear and to cause panic. And people tolerate fear because they think it's natural. Fear is not natural. As far as I know, we're only born with two fears innately. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. But other than those two, fear is an outside force set upon us by external elements. He says, be self-controlled and alert. The devil prowls around like a lion, a roaring lion, trying to scare you, seeking whom he may devour. So why is God looking for whom he may devour? Why does he have to, not God, oh, I got to quit that. Why is the devil seeking whom he may devour? Why doesn't he just devour? Because some are not devourable. If he could, he would just go after anyone and devour, and it would be just carnage. He would just attack. But some are undevourable because they know who their God is, And they understand spiritual warfare. And they understand the carpenter. And they understand the horns. And they understand the hammer. And the best tactics for beating the devouring spirit is to believe the promises of God. You got to know them to believe them. But you got to read them. Know them. Renew your mind with the word of God. Because he was there in the beginning. He was there. And he was the word was with God. And the word was God. And the spirit of the carpenter was there in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that's ever been made. Could God be more emphatic? He's the carpenter. In closing, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That's us. It is God who justifies. I know this message is for someone here today. I know that we struggle in these areas. So, uh, just ask the Holy Spirit. I mean, who has let the horns of opposition betray them and lie to them? Anybody? Anybody? Just can't, just for whatever reason, I I don't know. I'm not, I'm not moving forward, God, but you said I'm more than a conqueror. You said that all things are possible to him who believes. Who's been under that oppression. I can't give up. I can't get up. I can't, I can't go up. It's simply not possible. Who's been hindered at every turn and has had their head hung low for way too long? And who's let the fear of the devourer keep them from trusting God with everything? 
first service we opened up the altar and most people in the church came up. I'm not going to do that now, but there are prayer teams here for you to pray with you and for you, and please come and get some prayer. There's something about bringing something to the altar. Oh, I can just drop it here. You can, but it's a submission, just like worship. You know, things are hard the first time. That spirit of limitation, it's hard the first time. I mean, I, I, I thought, they're putting their hands up. What's up there? I ain't putting my hands up. I'm too busy. I'm flex and hold the thing and Man, the first time you put your hand up, it's like a helium balloon. Whoa, whoa. Giving, worshiping, submitting, coming to the altar, all those things are hard the first time. But there are barriers that we need to break in our life, and God wants us to get out of that comfort zone. And so I just want to pray that we can leave that stuff behind on the altar, bring those horns of oppressions, of tears and frustration, because this is my, my last word for you, but it's God is, for today, God is still in business. How many know God's still in business? The God of the impossible is still in business. He still makes great marriages. He still makes matches made in heaven. He's still a provider. He's still a builder. He's still a contractor. He's still a... Uh, a creator. He still advances the kingdom. He advances his people. He's still a promoter. He's still a healer. He's still a forgiver. He's still driving out evil spirits. He's still farming and planting. There's seed time and harvest time. He's still delivering and overcoming evil spirits that tell us lies to limit and devour. Let's pray. Father, spirit of the living carpenter, fall afresh on us today. Bring the hammer to the horns, God. Unite your people to build truly uh, prosperous eyes or lives in, in the way you see it, God. Not for our own gain or for lustful pleasures, but for your glory and for the good of others and the people you love, God. Help us. In Jesus' name. And I just want to tell you, and you might know this, most of you do, it starts with Jesus. It's all about the carpenter. An evil spirit can stand up to anything in this world except the carpenter. Except the carpenter. The Holy Spirit of God. Everything else is up for grabs. So the first thing, always, is the carpenter. Let his spirit flood your house. Let it flood your soul. Let it flood your heart. Let it flood your marriage. Let it flood your life. Let it flood your conversations. No evil spirit will ever stand up to the spirit of the carpenter. If you don't know Jesus, he's not your savior or you're not sure, make it so right now. It's between you and God. Just make it so before you leave this place. And we all pray a covering on those who might be in a place of decision. In Jesus' name, amen.